Welcome to the audio commentary for Dracula. This commentary will follow the version of the film that was restored by the British Film Institute National Film Archive in 2007. This is a restoration of the American version of the film, which was less censored than its British counterpart. However, it benefits from having the original British title card in place. And here we see the original credit for Universal International, who co-financed the production of this film and distributed it around the world from 1958 to 1964. My name is Marcus Hearn. I'm Hammer Films' historian, and I'm pleased to say that I'll be joined on this commentary by my friend and colleague, Jonathan Rigby, whose numerous books include Christopher Lee, The Authorised Screen History, and Studies in Terror, Landmarks of Horror Cinema. And this film certainly is a landmark of horror cinema, isn't it? Well, you know, Marcus, I don't think the word landmark covers it. I mean, it's a cast-iron classic. How wonderful it is there to see the film's original title card and its original title reinstated. In the decades since this film was released in 1958, it had become rather better known by its American title, Horror of Dracula. Indeed, from the early 1960s, and maybe even before that, Hammer's management even referred to the film as Horror of Dracula. We presume it was given this title in America to distinguish it from Universal's Dracula, which was still playing in some cinemas. Of course, no such distinction is necessary these days. So on this restoration, we have the ornate title card that British audiences would have seen when the film was first released in 1958. You know, I love this title sequence, the way you focus on the ornate stone eagle and then the camera starts to move stealthily around it on Jimmy Sangster's writer credit. And, of course, you're listening to the magisterial and absolutely classic theme by James Bernard in which he took the syllables of Dracula's name, Dracula, and turned them to a marvellous effect. The most exciting feature of that score, I think, is in the second phase of the theme where the snare drums come in. And now, after Terence Fisher's credit, the camera is going to the crypt. To all the critics who'd poured scorn on the curse of Frankenstein for being too gruesome and ghastly, here the camera tracks carefully towards Dracula's sarcophagus, and in an almost surreal touch, blood splatters down, forming an almost cruciform shape, which is a nice little gag. And uh, if you listen carefully to the soundtrack, you can hear it spattering. The shooting script, uh, prepared by Jimmy Sangster in uh, autumn 1957, specified that the film should begin in black and white and make the transition to colour with that scene. Well, that would have been startling too. But, I mean, colour, of course, is really one of the the important keynotes of this film. I mean, we even saw the the cover of Jonathan Harker's diary as a lustrous blood red. It's rather a self-important diary with a gold J.H. embossed on the front. Although Here that Johnson scene Harker. does introduce an anomaly, doesn't it? Because um, oh, yes. the, voiceover st- the voiceover states that it takes place on the 3rd of May 1885, as per Bram Stoker's novel. But um, right. this uh, location looks decidedly autumnal, doesn't it? Which is because, of course, this film was largely shot from November to December 1957. And later on we will discover, if we look very closely, that the action ends and Dracula is finally killed on the 18th of December. Hmm. So to imagine that this very tight, tightly constructed version of the novel actually takes place over about six months isn't really very feasible. Yes, that, that, vo- that voiceover is taken directly from the book, which begins 3rd of May, Bistritz. Um, but it doesn't really chime, as you say, with the autumnal look of the film. And there, Harker, played by John Van Eysen, casually glances down to the entrance of the mausoleum. Exactly, which, which we already know, thanks to the title sequence, is exactly that, the, the crypt. I love the, um, the effect of the shadow of the door opening across those wonderful blue drapes. In fact, this particular restoration restores the rather blue tone to the film that, um, that it originally had. I think some other home versions have been a little too hot and too bright. Yes, I think you're right. Yes, I think you're right. This has a rather more funereal atmosphere. But it still remains very lush. Oh, it, it remains think. remarkably lush. We're, and we're going to hopefully point out a whole bunch of lushnesses. Yes. And here is one of Bernard Robinson's marvellously baronial sets. Well, here we are in stage one of Bray Studios. In fact, when Harker arrived at uh, Castle Dracula in the entrance hall, that was also stage one of <laughs> Bray Studios. I mean, the arches in the entrance hall are remarkable, I think, in themselves. But, but their more mundane function was to disguise uh, and draw the eye away from the background. I mean, this was a set that production designer Bernard Robinson would reuse over and over again in this film. Yes. Uh, he would adapt and redress it. And he was covering his tracks there with those arches. Right. Harker has is just opening Dracula's 
letter to him, and I think we have to admire Dracula's calligraphy. He, uh, he <laughs> writes very well, my dear Harker, I am sorry, etc. Um, in a lovely uh, script there. He's, uh, as per the book, he's also the perfect host. He's left some lovely food out for Harker. We do have to ask ourselves, the, the very interesting uh, Fidelis et Morten, the yes. um, family crest. Faithful and dead. That <laughs> yes, that says it all, really. Um, one of the remarkable shifts in Hammer Horror was away from the kind of crepuscular gothic of Universal horror films. I mean, this is a very different castle to the one designed for the Universal Dracula in 1930. Yes, it's very clean for one it's, thing, it's, isn't it? it? It's like a gothic showroom. And one does have to ask oneself, um, did Dra does Dracula keep it so clean in a sort of magical way? Uh, unlike the book, where Dracula is actually seen making the beds and doing the dusting <laughs> effectively. <laughs> oh, we couldn't have that. And we couldn't have we Christopher couldn't Lee have doing that. that. Yeah. But we have to ask, uh, how does he keep it so clean? Since for the mundane business of... Um, of keeping his library in order, he has to bring someone oh, in, yes. i.e. Harker. This is a beautiful moment. He's obviously made vulnerable by crouching on the floor. We expect black drapes to sweep towards him, don't we? The black drapes of the malevolent male predator. But no, they're the white drapes of the beautiful Valerie Gaunt. Yes. I mean, you would expect a retelling of Dracula to feature three vampire brides, wouldn't you? But, but Valerie more than makes up for the absence of the other two. I That's think. right, and the, this was a classic piece of, of Sangster economy, of course, for Hammer purposes. Why have three voracious vampire women when uh, Valerie Gaunt can do the job by herself? Of course, she had made her previous film, uh, in fact, the, this and The Curse of Frankenstein are her only two film credits, for Hammer, and she played Justine, the maid, Frankenstein's maid, in The Curse of Frankenstein. She made a big impact there, and I think she makes a... A pretty big one here, yes, too. Yes, in this, her second and final film. Sangster's script says that the vampire woman is probably about 23 or 4 and possesses an almost perfect figure. We see now that what she is wearing leaves very little to the imagination. It is a semi-Grecian-style gown, cut low in the bodice and gathered at one side of the skirt. Now, the British Board of Film Censors were most alarmed when they read this and advised Hammer to ensure that all the ladies were adequately covered. Of course. Here is one of the great iconic moments of Hammer horror. Fisher was aware that there was Christopher Lee up at the top of the stairs, but he insisted that he be shown initially in silhouette because he was expecting all the smart, smart Alex in the audience to start laughing as soon as they saw him. So in a classic Fisher moment, with no cuts, he uses the actors to make, to make the camera move. Christopher Lee literally sweeps down the stairs and into extreme close-up in one beautiful movement. And in this two shot, you can realise that Christopher Lee is actually not that much taller than John Van Eysen, and yet Fisher has instructed his camera operator, Len Harris, to shoot the close-up of Lee from quite a low angle. That's I right. think to emphasise his omnipotence. Yeah. Fisher was also was very aware of the, the, the danger that smart Alex would laugh, so he was very keen that Dracula should appear as the quite normal, rather chilly, but quite normal mm. and very good-looking aristocrat that he does there. He was also very impressed by Christopher Lee's movement in the shot we've just seen, where he more or less glides up the stairs and Harker has to struggle to keep up with him. That's a shot that we will see paralleled at the end of the film when Dracula is seeking refuge in his castle and he bounds up the mm. same set of stairs mm. and Cushing, as Van Helsing, clatters his way up in a much mm. more human way. Mm. Well, at that moment, Dracula actually tells um, Harker that his housekeeper is away at the moment due to a family bereavement. That's, oh, that's one of the minor mysteries. There. Now, I wonder if Jimmy Sangster recalled this line when he wrote the film's second sequel, Dracula, Prince of Darkness, in 1965, because in that film we meet the faithful Clove, don't we, who seems to be minding Castle Dracula in his master's absence. That's right, Clove is introduced. I must say, the, the lushness and uh, detail and luxuriance of, of Bernard Robinson's sets is, is it always just beggar's belief. I mean, this bedroom that Harker is allocated is, is, a, is a beautiful It's clearly freezing bedroom. It's clearly freezing. As on several occasions in this film, you can see the November-December breath of the actors as they speak. And Harker. kudos here also to Jack Asher for his lush cinematography in this of scene course. as well. Absolutely. Harker has been recast by Sangster in a very daring touch, uh, not as an estate agent sent over from Exeter to help Dracula get across to England, but as an associate of Van Helsing's, a kind of junior vampire hunter. And all these vampire hunters are a bit like Boy Scouts. They all have a little kit bag of stakes and hammers, as we will see later. Um, but um, he's, he's, he's come to index Dracula's library, which um, is perhaps faintly improbable, but uh, it certainly gets the story moving in a much more dynamic way than would otherwise be the case. I love the lighting in this scene. 
The lighting is very eerie, but it's specially keyed onto Dracula himself to give him a specifically slightly more greenish tinge. And, of course, Christopher Lee's finger acting in this scene as he looks at Lucy's photo. Yes, well, the photo remarkable. of a face that he will remember, of course. That's right, when he needs to take his revenge. Film. Yes. Uh, the, the sort of redefinition of Dracula in this film extended even to, really, to his, to his costume and his appearance. Lee was given a, a rather silvery wig, I think probably in, a, in deference to the novel's Dracula, who in fact is positively white-haired and indeed has a white moustache. And some notes of Fisher's when he consulted the novel still survive, in which Fisher actually seriously considered using the white moustache. But, uh, well, Van Helsing does make reference to the fact he's possibly five or six hundred years old. That's right, that's point, right. So. But unlike Lugosi, Bela Lugosi in the Universal Dracula, who had a sort of oil slick of black hair, Lee's hair is more silvery. He has a very simple costume. He doesn't have Lugosi's short opera cape. He has a floor-length black cloak, and he has a specially, specially designed, I would imagine, suit with a very very high lapels to accommodate a simple cravat. It's very, very, very stripped down and black. And only later in Dracula, Prince of Darkness, would Lee agree to wear the red-lined cloak. Well, in Sangster's original script for now this, he also had a hat. He would have descended I'm, the stairs carrying a black hat, I'm which I think... very glad they cut the hat. Would have, ...would have diminished the impact. The top it's, hat, in fact. In this scene here, we learn that uh, Harker is, as you've said, not, in fact, Dracula's librarian, but his assassin. Well, his his um, potential assassin. Yes. He actually rather rather mucks it up, doesn't he? <laughs> well, I'm about to see how he does that here, aren't we? Mm. Now, I suppose we have to assume that it's the vampire woman who is unlocking the door for Harker at this point. He's been locked in by Dracula. Well, yes, I hadn't considered that, but of I course presume it's... Um, the vampire woman is out to get him. It's a honey she's... trap, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's a honey <laughs> trap. And... Um, I th this is a masterful suspense sequence. It leads up to the film's first big horror moment um, and the sort of warning sound of the bassoons on James Bernard's soundtrack somehow, for me, mesh perfectly with another big hammer signifier, which are the candy-curled pillars that we're about to see as Harker goes down the stairs. And there's a quivering... Um, atmosphere of suspense that's beautifully maintained by Terence Fisher. I think they're called barleycorn twists, aren't they? I beg your pardon, but I, I defer to your greater architectural knowledge. I love the uh, faintly inexplicable use of the shadow across the doorway there that helps draw Harker down. This is looking wonderfully blue, I must say, with the candlelight at the side and a boar's, a couple of boar's heads <laughs> projecting from the wall. The interesting thing about Robinson's design was that really he, re he reconfigured these gothic horror subjects as effectively taking place in England. This, it seems to me, is the home of a depraved English aristocrat. Yes, yes. Well, as, as in all Hammer Horror, it's all home yes. counties Transylvania, home isn't counties it? Trans and this set is yet another redressing of stage one, this time as the library. Well, of course, this is the same room in which Dracula will meet his end come the conclusion of the film. At this point in the film, the vampire woman makes an intriguing reference to the, the terrible things that Dracula does to her. I mean, this original phase of Hammer Horror was uh, contained arguably the, the least explicit films, I think, and it's that sort of dialogue implying something terrible and possibly perverse Indeed. that opens these films up to all sorts of intriguing interpretations. Uh, another example is the scene in The Curse of Frankenstein when the Baron suggests that his fiancée, Elizabeth, might one day play a role in his experiments. We're never oh, actually told horrible. exactly what he may have meant there. And we never learn what the, the terrible things are that, um, that Dracula does to this woman. But with you to help me, I will Although, having said that, she could, of course, just be making it all up, couldn't she? Indeed. To Indeed. To ensnare Harker Indeed. all the more successfully. She's doing a very good job here. She is, and as soon as he puts his arms around her, I think we can guess that he's perhaps contemplating some kind of naughtiness. Is it comforting her in a more direct way? Mm, possibly. Perhaps? I think that the vampires have already started to unravel the, the fabric of the society outside their castle. She has lovely gold fingernails, and then we see this beautifully timed moment when her eyelids bat at the sight of his neck. Now, as originally shot, we would have seen the vampire woman's fangs pierce Harker's neck, but this was cut by the British Board of Film Censors in February 1958. Uh, unfortunately, it's proved impossible to locate that version of the scene in Japan or anywhere else, and it's the absence of that scene, which it seems ran to exactly the same length, 
that prevents us describing the 2012 restoration of this film as the director's cut. Nevertheless, it's good to know that the 2012 restoration closely matches the content that Terence Fisher intended in almost every other respect. Now, this is the film's first big horror scene. It's an absolutely shatteringly, dynamically and brilliantly staged scene. Uh, it, it comes about half an hour before the first big horror scene in The Curse of Frankenstein came. I think they may have said to themselves, we've got to get the horror in quicker this time. Um, and despite the fact that there's only one vampire woman, it really does vividly convey the spirit of the novel at this point, uh, in which... Harker says, the Count, never did, I, never did I imagine such wrath and fury. Even in the demons of the pit, his eyes were positively blazing. The red light in them was lurid, as if the flames of hell fire blazed behind them. And I think the wonderful lighting, the wonderful acting from Lee in that staggering close-up when he bears his fangs with the blood streaming down his chin, um, it is a keynote scene in Hammer Horror. And I, I've watched this film, I mean... I blush to imagine how many times I've watched this film, but every time I see that scene, it leaves me slightly shaken. It's so well staged. It is. It's, it's feral, isn't it's it? Fer it's a feral I, I, scene. It is a total redefinition of the vampire because a vampire had never been seen being quite that animalistic before. And let's give a shout-out to Valerie Gaunt because she, she does her stuff there too. She too is um, completely animalistic. And indeed, she is, she is the one who, in, in a mainstream horror film is the first vampire to actually have fangs because we see her fangs first. I managed to do all that while wearing a pair of blue high heels. That's right. Which you can see very clearly in this remaster. That's right. It's, it's difficult to do battle with the king vampire if that's you're right. teetering on a pair of blue high heels. And Yeah, he does get the better of her, <laughs> perhaps as a consequence. The candle signifies the passage of a day here, and uh, Terence Fisher recalled that his cinematographer, Jack Asher, could never resist combining re red and green in his films, and, uh, and we can see that in the decanters on Harker's table. Well, I, I think just, just those little details like that, the, the beautiful fluids, the, the curling smoke of the decayed candle, I mean, it lends a, a beauty to these films, coupled with the lustrous blue of his smoking jacket and the red of the curtains, etc. It lends a, a beauty to, to the film, which, you, you know, up, up to 1958, people had not anticipated seeing in horror films. And uh, I think... Um, people were startled you know they were used to horror films being a bit cheesy by this stage and the sheer level of physical beauty remar was remarkable there's a lot of very gestural acting in this film particularly from Van Eysen here as Harker and later from Michael Goff as Homewood those two actors in particular sort of melodramatic gestural acting we just saw he just uh, sees the bite marks on his throat and he sinks down in a very um formalised way onto his valise in a gesture of despair. Yeah, the um, years haven't been quite so kind to that style well, of performance, I have think, they, really? Given that it's, it seems to be confined to Harker and Homewood, I, I wonder if it was deliberate, but it does mean that those two characters stand in stark contrast to Dracula and Van Helsing, who are played in a very modern style mm. by two very modern actors. It's interesting to note that John Van Eysen has the diction of a previous decade. Um, he sounds very like the sort of brief encounter received pronunciation that we remember from the 40s. He actually says, rather than however, he actually says, hi ever. And, uh, Valerie Gaunt has a touch of that as well. Valerie Gaunt has a touch she? of that. And, in, and indeed, you then have Dracula talking to Harker and him saying, however, in, in the modern way that we would understand. So I think that's an indication that there's sort of different acting styles involved here. I think it was certainly deliberate on Michael Goff's part. I don't know as much about John Van Eysen. Um, uh, Hammer. He was certainly popular at Hammer he in the mid-50s. He was, was in Four Sided Triangle. He'd been in Quasimass Quasi 2 before this. Uh, and was actually nearing the end of his acting career because uh, yes, he I retired think he, in 63, I think, and became an executive at Columbia Pictures. He became Columbia's... Big British, the major British. He ran well, the even, British even, operation. Even beyond that, he ran the operation, the whole operation outside America, I think, ultimately. Around about 1990, um, a, a woman I was with at drama school, um, actually, her boyfriend was John Van Eysen's son, David Van Eysen, and uh, they're still together. And so I had a phone conversation with John Van Eysen, uh, who died soon afterwards, and uh, he told me, frankly, that he couldn't remember anything about this film except for the fact that he got married during the filming and that they threw a party for him, and I presume his wife, uh, on the set. That was, that's, that's, I think that's an exclusive. Um, that, that's, I think that's the only time anybody ever talked to John Van Eysen about this film, and I'm afraid to say he didn't remember a thing about it, except that. <laughs> anyway, it's very well, odd. I'm sure that's, that, that's indicative of, of, of the legendary family atmosphere at Bray Studios, wasn't it? Absolutely. 
It's very odd that there's a shrine directly outside Castle Dracula and a little brook, a little bit of running water, which in the sequel, Dracula Prince of Darkness, will turn into a fully-fledged moat. Yes, yes. Now, the blue is really paying dividends here. There are even a couple of skulls in the corner there. We're getting a bit more of the Gothic atmosphere in the lower depths. In the classic Gothic configuration, you have the upper parts of the house, which are kind of quite presentable, but in the lower depths, you find this nasty atmosphere, the, the blue-tinted close-ups on Dracula, and Harker approaching the vampire woman's sarcophagus. He's about to make an elementary mistake. By going for the vampire woman first. Yes. yes. Of course, had he not made this elementary mistake, there would be no film. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I must say, Valerie Gaunt yeah. looks very grotesque in that um, yes. pose there with her teeth showing. In the this is an example, I think, what we're looking at here, of Fisher's trademark style in the Gothic horrors. I mean, he carefully paces the shocks, doesn't he, building them throughout the film. In this scene, uh, which is the first staking, yes. we don't actually see the stake going into the vampire woman's body, do we? I mean, the right. view is either suggested in shadow, as it is here, or it's obscured, as it is there. Yes. Um, it's often been said that Hammer's strength lay in the fact that they suggested the horror in their films rather than showing it. Generally speaking, I don't think that's true at all, mm. but uh, it's partially correct in scenes like this. Well, Fisher very carefully paced the three stakings. He, he wanted to make them distinct. He thought they would become very old very quickly if you saw the same stuff. As far as he was concerned, the important thing with this staking was Dracula's reaction, the fact that he wakes up. I mean, obviously, th that is what continues the scene. And you have some deeply scary close-ups of Lee waking up, that, looking enraged when he realises what's happening, and then that ghastly smile he gives when he sees that the uh, sun has gone down. Why he has a window in his crypt which can indicate to him <laughs> when the sun goes down, and indeed when it's up, I don't know. But let's pass over that one. There are illogicalities. As we'll see later, scene. Jimmy Sankster's interpretation of vampirism is almost scientific, or at least biological, yes. as opposed to supernatural. But there are some suggestions in the film, such as in this scene right here, uh, that Dracula is somehow able to defy the laws of physics. I mean, earlier, Harker That's is right. surprised that the vampire woman is able to arrive by his side without making any sound at all. Mm. Um, and here, Dracula does a similar thing. And Terence Fisher said he wanted to get across Dracula's power to overcome the limitations of time and space. Well, Tony Hines, the film's producer, has gone on record as saying that he gave the editor a terrible extra amount of work by insisting on having all Dracula's footsteps removed from the soundtrack, which again gave him an otherworldly quality. Well, that's the end of Act One, effectively. Sangster was very keen on the three-act structure. The end of the Castle Dracula sequences, the initial Castle Dracula sequences, signify the end of Act One. Here is the beginning of Act Two. Yes, and of course, and, uh... we have... Van Helsing introduced right at the but top. Before that, the first appearance of the inhospitable innkeeper in a hammer horror. This That's is right. George Woodbridge. Who else could it possibly be but George Woodbridge taking snuff? Who, who became one of the great signifying actors of, of hammer horror, really, didn't he? Yes, a very, impo uh, very important part of the rep company. That's right. Now, we see Van Helsing's lovely astrakhan collar before we see the man himself, so Cushing is given a big star build-up here. Only now does he turn to the camera, looking at the garlic flowers, depending from the ceiling, what's that about? Already doing some lovely Peter Cushing mannerisms, blowing on his hands because he's been out in the cold. Looking around at uh, similarly inhospitable locals. Bottle of Gordon's dry gin there, sorting rather oddly with the Germanic <laughs> drinks elsewhere yes, and posters yes. and what have you. And uh, we're about to meet Inga. Inga, who is played by an actress called Barbara Archer. Here she is. Here now, she, is. she may have been smarting slightly when she made this film because in late 56, she'd played the matron in the BBC's sitcom Wacko with Jimmy Edwards. But right about this time, she'd been supplanted from that part by Liz Fraser, who had become a, an iconic figure in British comedy. So, yes, Barbara Archer was the original matron, but by the time this film was made, she'd been she'd been removed. Well, she very much fits our conception of uh, late 1950s glamour here, doesn't she? She does. I mean, she this does. was her only Hammer role, but, yes. uh, but she played barmaids in quite a few other films, she including um, yeah. Libel and 633 Squadron. Yes. And uh, the set that we're on here is, was built on stage three at Bray Studios, which was uh, actually a room in the main house. And uh, right. because it was largely rectangular in shape, uh, production designer Bernard Robinson liked to construct pubs and inns with long bar areas in this right. room. Now, Cushing was still principally a television actor at this point, I think, but he's every inch a film star as well, isn't he? Uh, and Hammer knew it. I, I think a more accurate title for this film would have been Van Helsing 
<laughs> well, he is the protagonist, absolutely. He appears, as I said, at the beginning of Act Two, but nevertheless, he dominates the action from now on. But one of the features of this film, which does make it very faithful to the book, is the fact that Dracula becomes a background figure after the initial act, or in terms of the book, the first four chapters. Dracula recedes into the background, but you never forget him. His baleful presence hangs over the whole film because, of course, he is the antagonist who must be destroyed. Nevertheless, in dramatic terms, the focus now shifts very firmly to Van Helsing. But nevertheless, Cushing, uh, Hammer regarded Cushing as their big star, which I think is possibly why Christopher Lee was not asked to return for the sequel to this film, but Peter Cushing was. Well, we may never know. They may just have been following the Universal template of making Van Helsing the continuing character in the sequel, as Universal's Van Helsing was in Dracula's Daughter. That's, I think that's one of those enduring mysteries that may never be cleared up. They did have a... That I think they felt that they, they had sort of made Christopher Lee a star... Uh, just as Frankenstein had made the creature that Christopher Lee played, whereas Peter Cushing came to them as a star. They'd sought him before The Curse of Frankenstein and not got him. Um, so I think they had a bit more veneration for Cushing at this point, and they, they built him up, and Christopher Lee, really, oh, he's the fellow who played the monsters. But the fact that they could still have that attitude after this film, in which he plays one of the most innovative monsters in the history of horror and give such a startling physical performance. The fact that they could still have that attitude to Christopher Lee after this film is, frankly, inexplicable to me. This the is driver of this hearse touch. is the uncredited George Mosman. Who was um, the big movie coach driver of the period. He was, yes. yes. Hammer hired most of their coaches and horses from, uh, from his family company. And uh, as of 2012, it's still possible to see the Mosman collection of carriages in a museum in Luton. There you go. Well, that's a very stylish touch. I mean, many um, commentators have described Cushing's Baron Frankenstein and Lee's Count Dracula as kind of gothic forebears of James Bond. And I think the fact that he goes out and about in a white coffin that's housed in a black-plumed hearse drawn by black-plumed horses, it's a very, um, very swish, very stylish touch. Now we're back on stage one at Bray Studios. Uh, stage one was completed in September 1957, and this was only the second time it's been used by Hammer. The first time was for a largely forgotten Jimmy Sangster thriller called The Snorkel, Indeed, which was yes. Sangster's fourth film, and this was his fifth. Um, and, of course, the building of that stage, newly opened, as you say, when this film began production, of course, is a, is a, is a big indication of why this film has more breadth than the Curse oh, of Frank. Oh, yes. I mean, the Curse of Frankenstein is much more confined in comparison to this. I mean, they've obviously spent a lot of money on stage one, thanks to the Curse of Frankenstein, I'm sure, the influx of money that came into Bray that enabled yep. them to build it, and they've certainly used every inch of it. Yeah. This is one of the most sinister little touches in the film, the fact that Lucy's photograph has gone and just a little scrap remains. Well, it's, in it's, it's been torn out in a rage, presumably, yes. isn't it? judging by the fragment that remains and the broken glass. The whole room has been ransacked. Um... Not entirely sure why, because, um, you know, if he's after the photograph, he knows where that is. But nevertheless, the whole room has been ransacked. Well, he's got a temper, isn't he? I mean, he's notorious he's for He's got it. a temper on him, Dracula. This particular Dracula is, uh, well, I think he's one of the most remorseless and beastly Draculas on record. I think this is why Lee qualifies as the definitive Dracula. I oh, think. yes. Now it's time for Van Helsing to enter the crypt. The, um, the old lady in the coffin whose name posterity does not record. It has to be said, in this close-up, is actually visibly twitching her <laughs> lip and heaving her breast. <laughs> She's exhaling, isn't she? Uh, yeah. She wasn't but, very happy about the whole thing. Geoffrey Belden, who played the hotel porter, remembered that she was absolutely outraged when she discovered that all she was required to do was to lie still in a coffin. <laughs> and she couldn't and, even do that. Well, apparently Terence Fisher had to give her a little kiss in order to oh. persuade her to get into the coffin. And after that, she became quite, um, she became quite keen and even oh. suggested that she took her dentures out. To so give that her face that shrunken that look. drawn, shrunken appearance. Yeah. Well, I'm going to throw in an arcane touch here. She looks to me very like the um, elderly female vampire, vampire featured in Carl Dreyer's Vampire from 1930, who was played by an actress called Henriette Gerard. She has that, very much has that look. Now, I think it's safe to assume that more of this scene 
was actually shot because there is at least one still showing Harker's shriveled corpse after it is staked. Now, mm. as far as we know, this wasn't cut by the British Board of Film Censors, so maybe it's cut by the producer, Tony Hines. I Thank mean, God it was cut. The, uh, the makeup is, was dreadful. It is very silly. Still. Very silly. Van Eysen looks properly sinister with his hair crisped up and the fangs jutting over his upper lip there, but uh, that makeup that they had for him, post staking, with the Yes, I think that was an instance of Hammer awful. censoring themselves. OK, Act Two gets into gear with the introduction of Arthur Homewood and his wife, Mina. Michael Goff, there he is, and uh, Melissa Stribling, who is off screen at the moment. Yeah, both making their first <coughs> Hammer appearances here. Yes. And um, Michael Goff had been an actor for over 20 years at this stage. He'd been a film actor for over 10. He gives a very f mannered, even fey performance in this film. And uh, some of his line readings uh, get laughs from modern audiences, I have to say. Maybe they got laughs even at the time. But um, he does seem to be part of a, of, a, of, a, of a plan here. Harker and Homewood are the ineffectual males who cannot possibly square up to the sexual allure of Dracula. And in Goff's case, the character becomes... Almost well, fair, yeah, I mean, I think it helps that he's playing an ineffectual character, but I must admit, in my opinion, Goff is probably the weak link in the whole production. In fact, Melissa Stribling herself was uh, bemused by Goff's performance, and at one point she said to him, Good God, what are you doing? And he really? apparently replied, I'm chewing. As in, <laughs> I'm chewing the scenery. The scenery yes. I thought that would be one way to play it. Now, there was no time for rehearsal on Hammer films, but if there had been, maybe Terence Fisher could have ironed this out. Mm. Well, I think it's a classic case of an actor mistaking the film he's in. Just think, I think possibly there's an argument to say that he thought this was just a piece of rubbish. Well, he should act compared to some of the rubbish that Goff appeared in... Subsequent. <laughs> subsequently. Subsequently, well, yeah. he became a kind of latter-day Lionel did. Atwell, didn't he, playing horror movie nutcases Unfortunately, yes. in all sorts of yeah. And it, it could just be that nobody told him that this was going to be one of the good ones. Uh, yes, he chose the wrong film to be... Mm. Not at the top of his game. Now, here is Carol Marsh yes. as Arthur's sister, Lucy. Carol was born Norma Simpson. And, uh, and like Michael Goff, she was someone else who was a little disparaging about this film in later years, sadly. Yes, she gives a beautiful performance. She plays a kind of child woman initially. And as she comes under Dracula's influence, I mean, it's just a lovely performance. Terence Fisher, in particular, thought that both the main women in this film were fantastic. And, and he wasn't wrong. One interesting feature is the fact that um, Carol Marsh as the child woman here, was 32 at the time, and Melissa Stribling had just turned 30. And, of course, within 10 years, Hammer's casting of their female leads was going to alter remarkably and taste the blood of Dracula in 1969. Linda Hayden was the main attraction, and she was 16 at the time. Here, yes, but the world had changed. women are in their 30s. The world had changed an awful lot, hadn't it, in those intervening 10 years? It certainly had, yes. But, uh, now, as you said, this is one of Terence Fisher's favourite scenes in the whole film we're looking well, at here. Well, we see his... He was very pleased with Carol's uh, balletic movements. Well, she is the virginal uh, heroine who has had a new experience and is now awaiting the return of the man who gave it to her with the trademark Terence Fisher falling leaves there. Yes, Behind yes. the French windows. Yes, and Jack Asher's very precise lighting of her nightdress. Yes. Uh, most of the uh, most of the clothes in this film were hired from um, theatrical costumiers, but uh, the night dresses, yeah. night dresses, and the ladies' gowns, or rather the vampire woman's gown and the night dresses, were specially made. Uh, they had their priorities right. She also, <laughs> to, to signify a kind of loss of innocence, she takes her crucifix off yes. in anticipation of Dracula's arrival. Now, this this is beautiful. She she she's simultaneously fearful and excited, and I, I think she gets that across beautifully. Of course, she'd, she'd, she'd appeared in another British classic, Brighton Rock, hadn't she, in 1947, and um, had given a lovely performance in that. Van now, Van Helsing uses a, a phonograph cylinder here to record his, his memos, and um, he does. as per the novel, but I mean, this is a little early for 1885, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility. No, well, uh, phonographs were well established in the 1890s, which is why Dr. Seward's contribution... Uh, Dracula, of course, isn't an epistolary novel. It's written in letters and documents and the rest of it. Dr. Seward's contributions are his diary kept in phonograph, which was one of the very modern touches yes, that Stoker yes. brought to the Dracula story. Yes. And but also helps us, the audience, to understand uh, Van Helsing's preparations for Absolutely. his mission. It's I mean, brilliant. this scene is pretty much as Jimmy Sangster describes it in his shooting script, which points out that Van Helsing is staying in the best hotel in town. Ah, well, so he should. And here is Geoffrey Bailden, <laughs> yeah. who, was, uh, who was 33 years old when he and made this film. And still already playing 
Old man. Yeah, he had previously appeared in a small role in uh, Camp on Blood Island. And, oh, yes. Uh, he'd returned to Hammer in Journey to the Unknown and uh, a film called Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed, which many people would probably argue was Terence Fisher's second best film, I yes, think. absolutely. Oh, it's a, it's a corker. Um, Van Helsing's plum-coloured smoking jacket and waistcoat w w were considered very eye-catching at the time in the late 50s. Um, they were an indication of just how beautiful these films looked. And but gives us Jack Ash's beloved um, combination of green and red. Absolutely, in slightly different shades, a kind of minty shade for the room and a plum for Van Helsing. But the use of the phonograph, taken directly from the novel, is actually, as you pointed out, a brilliant means of exposition on Sangster's part, mm. because Van Helsing can play it back, talk into it, and mm. tell us everything we need to know. And Vampire. also, I think, helps to establish Van Helsing as a, as a scientist, doesn't it? It further, it further distances Van Helsing from supernatural practices. I mean, in this scene, he compares Dracula's victims to, to drug addicts, for yes. example. Yes. And I remember um, the scene where he actually records into the machine. Here it is. Here it is now. It was, uh, was chosen by the BBC to open the montage that they compiled when Cushing That's died. That's right. What a beautiful montage that was. Yes, he's, this is, this is the, the drug addict moment, and this is a very masterfully placed scene, really. We get exposition about vampires and vampirism placed in the middle of the very tensely erotic sequence in which Dracula visits Lucy, because we're going to cut direct to Dracula any moment. A very effective cut, because it takes us from a close-up of Van Helsing direct to a close-up of Dracula in Lucy's in Lucy's window. But you're right, Van Helsing is a scientist. He approaches this stuff scientifically, and it's in line with Sangster's demystification of the vampire. In fact, as we know, um, Van Helsing will later on say the idea that they turn into bats and wolves is a common fallacy. Yeah, and I think, like, like so many other elements of Sangster's script, that was prompted by uh, budgetary constraints. But nevertheless, it did help. It all helped to redefine Dracula for a modern audience and to yes. distance Hammer from Universal. Fisher, Terence Fisher was very keen that he felt the whole bats and wolves business meant that credibility disappeared right there. Well, they just wouldn't have been able to do it properly, yeah. would they? I think. Yeah, and they wouldn't have. And as I'm afraid turned uh, turned out to be the case in the Brides of Dracula, a couple of years after this, when there was indeed a big prop bat, which wasn't very good, and of course went against Van Helsing's strictures in this film. Well, continuity was uh, was never Hammer's strong point, was it? Certainly, continuity between films, anyway. Indeed. Well, Carol Marsh again gave a marvellous indication of her combined fear and excitement there. Here's that great Hammer veteran, Charles Lloyd Charles Pack. Charles Lloyd Pack. Playing the mystified Dr Seward. I mean, it's a much smaller role here than he occupies in the novel, isn't it? Um, Lloyd Pack had already been in Quatermass 2, yes. and he'd appear in another five films for the company. And here is nine-year-old Yanina Fay, yes. making her Hammer debut as Gerda's cheeky daughter, Tanya. Yes. Uh, the little girl was called Vera in Jimmy Sangster's original script. Vera? Mm. Oh, I'm glad they changed that. <laughs> you know, Yanina wasn't old enough to see the film when it came out and only saw it for the first time in a cinema when it was screened as part of the Barbican's Hammer season huh, in 1996. In yeah. There's a lovely exchange here. A child's logic can be most disconcerting, to which Mina says, uh, yes, as if to say, yeah, you're not a very good doctor, actually, are you? <laughs> and the child has seen through you. But the look on Seward's face is priceless, isn't it? Yes, but Sangster did actually go on record as saying that scenes 48, 49 and 50 with Dr Seward examining the sick Lucy were cut completely, probably for length purposes. Whether or not they were ever shot, I don't know, but I doubt it because in subsequent scenes the Doctor is just a rather ineffectual character and no longer the pompous ass, <laughs> as I had written him. <laughs> anyway, they got Charles Lloyd Pack in to do this small role. Yes. And uh, we always love to see Charles Lloyd Pack and all these yes. other Hammer character actors. Mina is now on her way to get a second opinion, as suggested by Seward, in... Not one of the most effective costumes, Hammer. Not the most together. flattering dress, is the, it? Well, it, it's really the, um, the the hat and the stole. No, not stole. Anyway, but the cape. That's it. Yeah. Stole. What am I talking about? Cape. Uh, yes, they look very off the peg, which is something Hammer normally disguised rather better, I think. Yes. But I think we should talk about Melissa Stribling for a bit. Oh, she's very, very she's good in this film. She's fantastically good she? in this film. She's a very attractive woman, not in a kind of improbably beautiful way, in a kind of in, in a kind of. Um, in a, woman, in a very mature way, and I don't mature, mean that in a disparaging way at all. Mature and intelligent in a yes. way that Hammer's heroines kind of tended not to be later. Yes. Um, and she gives a great performance. She was married to the director, Basil Dearden. Yes, and have been since she was 17, I believe. Is that right? Mm. And um, she, she, I, I must say, it's a very unsung performance. I think she's really 
really good in this film. I mean, Sangster didn't write great parts for women at this early stage. In fact, Fisher himself said that, as written, these two parts meant nothing. And that working with the actresses, he, you know, he was happy to say that, you know, that the women actually acquired some substance. And um, a big contributor to that was Melissa Stribling and, uh, and Carol Marsh. Well, yes, I herself. mean, he didn't cast either. In fact, he didn't cast this film at all, he claimed, but uh, he was especially happy with those two. Well, I, I think they're, they're, they're brilliant. I mean, it makes you wonder who did cast these films. I think Anthony Hines played a big part. We know well, that he certainly he personally he, cast, he personally them, cast Valerie Gaunt in The Curse of Frankenstein. Well, because he'd seen her on the telly, hadn't mm. he? But uh, Fisher said he had no part in the casting of these films. In fact, he said that Charles Gray in The Devil Rides Out was the only part he ever cast. I don't buy that myself. I think the director... I mean, there are pe the people... Uh, Robert Morris from Frankenstein Creative Woman maintained that he went to audition for Terence Fisher. Um, of course the director was involved in the casting. He, I feel he must have been. I mean, you know, Hammer knew by now that Terence Fisher was the go-to guy for these gothic subjects. He just had such a perfect feel for them. They're not going to just cast the thing over his head. I well, yes, like he certainly felt he had more control over this film than he had the previous one. I mean, he hadn't chosen to make The Curse of Frankenstein. He did a very good job of it. He hadn't chosen to do it, but he definitely asked to direct this. Yes. Well, how could they have had anybody else direct it after the success of that film? Yes, I mean, he regarded this subject, as he said, um, infinitely more poetic and also more tragic. He also chose, he said, not to watch Universal's Dracula in preparation or well, to read Bram Stoker's book. Yeah, that was a very good idea. And I think Christopher Lee said the same thing, didn't he? He chose not to rewatch or watch Universal's Dracula before he did this. Well, why, why would you? I mean, you want to stamp a completely fresh interpretation on it, yes. don't you? I think yeah. here we begin to realise that Van Helsing is himself a slightly frightening character. His um, tight-lipped instructions to Mina are, are a little bit scary. He's certainly obsessive. He's and, obsessive. Um, and, in yes. fact, Terence Fisher went on record saying that uh, Van Helsing was a pure type of character. I don't think that Van Helsing had any sexual feelings towards anybody in any shape or form. He was also one of the most ruthless characters one could ever meet. And, of course, in order to stamp out these pesky vampires, well, he has to be, doesn't he? Yes, he's a man on a mission, isn't he? One of the fascinating features of the film is that not only has Dracula been given a youthful makeover by an actor who was 35 at the time that this film was made, but, of course, also Van Helsing has been given the same thing. There's the classic, There's the classic cushing, cushing finger, finger yes. yes, to Which emphasize was Already emphasize one points. of his acting trademarks, wasn't it? Yes, but Van Helsing is a small... Dutchman in the book with reddish hair and uh, he speaks a, a species of double Dutch. Um, here he's become a dynamic swashbuckling figure who yes, is chilly yes, and rather alarming yes. but, but, but a man of yes. ac physical action played by a 44 year old yes, unlike yes. Edward Van Sloan yes. who was to look at anyway a much more um, elderly it's just figure in another the facet films. of Hammer's reinvention isn't it? Total reinvention as I've said on many occasions whenever I see a book that refers to these films as remakes, that book goes straight in the bin. Yes, I mean, of these films these films were not remakes of by course. any stretch of the imagination. In fact, this was the Dracula story coming home because it had been handled in Germany with Nosferatu in 1921. It had then gone across to America in 1930 for the Universal Dracula. Now, finally, it comes back to where it belongs, Britain. And not just Britain, but Britain's London's showbiz milieu because, of course, Bram Stoker had been the acting manager of the great thespian Sir Henry Irving. And his headquarters at the Lyceum Theatre, just off the Strand, in the late in the 1890s, is kind of analogous to the Wardour Street headquarters of the showbiz entrepreneurs of the late 50s, namely James Carreras and yes. co. at Hammerfield. Yes. Now, poor old Gerda is about to seal Lucy's fate by removing the garlic flowers. Gerda's, Terrible mistake. Gerda's just too... But this is, this is based very carefully on the book, in which... Um, yes. Lucy's mm. mother in the book takes away all the foul-smelling flowers because she can't understand how they could possibly have been medicinal. But so much of what goes wrong in this film is Gerda's fault, isn't it, bless her? Gerda was played by Olga Dickey, Olga Dickey. who can be seen in the pre-credits of The Kiss of the Vampire Later at the Graveside, yes. and That's she's right. another housekeeper in The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. Oh, so she is, yes. Now, here, the, we don't even... In the second visitation of Dracula, we don't even see Dracula because Fisher was concerned that the emotional core of the scene, and he was... In all his films, it was the emotion in the films that he wanted to bring out, the emotional core of the scene. Well, he once said himself, I'm, a, I'm not an intellectual director, I'm an emotional, an emotional director. director. But the emotional core of this was not the actual visit from Dracula, but the drawing of the emerald-covered sheet over her face. 
to indicate that the film has reached another watershed, Dracula has claimed another victim. Now, of course, Lucy is intended, in a departure from the novel, as an act of... The death of Lucy is an act of revenge on Dracula's part because she was Harker's fiancée. Harker has killed his concubine in the castle, so he's going to go out, having killed Harker first, he's going to go out and replace that concubine with Harker's fiancée. And so far, at least, he's succeeded. Van Helsing is now responding to, again, some slightly... Um, uh, uh, some line readings of Goffs in his grief at the death of his sister, which... Um, uh, indicate that Cushing and Goff, in this film at least, were acting from completely opposing ends of the thespian spectrum. I mean, really, Cushing is a very modern actor, and in this film at least, Goff is doing that stuff that Melissa Stribling found so mystifying. Yes, and it's interesting to look at Jimmy Sankster's shooting script, actually, because there aren't too many lines that Cushing didn't of his own lines, rather, that Cushing didn't alter in some way. Well, Cushing wasn't a fan of Sankster's dialogue, was he? No, but I think it's interesting to look at the ways in which he alters them. He makes his he makes his own lines, I think, in many places rather less melodramatic than they would have been. He simplifies them originally. He? He, he sort of strips them, off yes. the ornate, modernises bits them. Nonsense, maybe we could say yes. Pieces, yeah. But um, unfortunately, yes, this does introduce a tonal inconsistency throughout the film. Yes, we'll see more of that later in the crypt sequence. I think it's it's very very visible in the crypt sequence indeed. This looks like rather a small set. Well, it's the Homewood House drawing room. Yes, this yeah. was stage two at Bray, which was a small brick stage that adjoined um, the side of the main house. Uh, but yes, it is unusually cramped, even by, um, even by the contemporary standards of, of Bray Studios. Yeah. Tanya has gone missing and is about to be brought in by an, a stalwart of British films <laughs> called George, George Merritt, Merritt yes. who is the most pucker... Transylvanian policeman <laughs> ever. <laughs> I found this little girl here. That's right. Uh, it's not a little girl, a little oh, girl. Yeah. No. And uh, George Merritt had been in any number of films over the Well, he was hugely prolific, wasn't he, from the 1930s onwards. Yes. And, uh, and like Charles Lloyd Pack, had just appeared in Quatermass 2. That's right, yes. Uh, he's playing to type here as the slightly gruff policeman. And I remember him from a very funny cameo as a postman in the television series The Prisoner. Ah, yes, of course, yes. Yanina Fay uh, claims that she was under consideration for the part of the young Elizabeth in The Curse of Frankenstein prior to this, but that the part went, as we, the part went, as we know, to the daughter of the actress who actually played the older Elizabeth, uh, Hazel Court. Um, but, of course, Yanina Fay was to go on to appear in uh, a few other Hammer films, wasn't she? Well, yes. I mean, uh, notably, Never Take Sweets from a Stranger. Very controversial film. Which is uh, one of Hammer's most important films. Yes. I mean, not a very yes. well-remembered film, sadly, but one of the most important films. She also has a very small role uh, for Terence Fisher in The Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll. That's right, yes, that's right. Anyway, she's just made the announcement that the, the woman she went off with was Aunt Lucy. How can this be? Aunt Lucy is dead. Now, of course, Homewood is beginning to understand that Van Helsing might have a point. By which time, yes, but at this point the audience is screaming at the man. Yes, <laughs> for God. Well, of course, there always has to be a character in there. And of indeed, course. Dr Seward in yes. the book, in the book yeah. is very much this character. He is the credulous, or rather the incredulous character, who has to be convinced because he kind of stands in for mm. the audience in that way. But by this stage, as you say, the audience are saying, for God's sake. Mm. Now, we've just seen the exterior of the Homewood family tomb, which oh, is yes. incredibly yet another redressed version of the stage one set that we've seen three times already. We've seen it as the Castle Dracula entrance hall, the dining room and the library. Mm. Uh, Bernard Robinson was certainly resourceful. Yes, well, that stairway is actually quite recognisable as Dracula's. Uh, two once, you, once you're once you looking for it, once, once, you know, once it's once pointed you know. out to you, Absolutely, yes. yes. Uh, now, we've seen a similar tomb in The Curse of Frankenstein, but I think this is rather better realised. All that swirling mist is certainly an innovation that wasn't there in the Frankenstein film. It's beautiful, and it's all blue. The mist is all blue. Yeah. It's wonderfully And, of course, now Arthur has finally twigged that the dead are walking. You said that we're looking at twigs now, and you said, good <laughs> Lord, yes. gosh. Do you see what I did there? Oh, yeah. you see what you did there? Now, we're not sure where these twigs were filmed, um, but it certainly looks like the same area of woodland near Bray Studios that was the location uh, in The Curse of Frankenstein where Kremper shoots the creature uh, in the yes. eye. yes. This is a beautiful scene. I mean, Carol, the little beat that Fisher deliberately left, he actually went on record saying that he deliberately left a little beat to increase the disconcertedness mm. when you see 
Lucy's face and the slight reveal of her fangs there. And she comes out with one of the most chilling lines, I think, in all horror films, when she says, in very Celia Johnson brief encounter diction, I know somewhere nice and quiet where we yes. can play. Yeah. By which she means a graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very horrible yeah. necrophile yeah. undertow to that. And the fact that it's a little girl she's saying it to was actually drawn attention to in some of the Well, critiques. that would have been ra rather stronger, actually, had the original script had been shot. There's a suggestion that the little girl would actually have become a victim. Now, Melissa Stribling remembered that Carol Marsh cried when Terence Fisher insisted she had to wear her vampire fangs. Apparently, she was worried that she wouldn't look pretty. Uh, Yanina Fay remembers that Carol tried to play those scenes without opening her mouth, so you wouldn't see the fangs. Ah, oh, well, those Carol... cascading leaves again in the background to, uh, yes. to indicate the presence of the supernatural. There's something, again, very unhealthily sexual about her Arthur, dear brother, line readings. And this is a classic Fisher moment, breaking up the frame with the rather illogical intrusion of Van Helsing. How come Homewood and Lucy weren't aware of him lurking in the mist yes. there? Yeah. But, you know, this is a moment so iconic, the intrusion of the crucifix. It's a shocking moment, and yet, oddly enough, of course, a crucifix is a, is a symbol of salvation and... Uh, and, and yet it's used for shocking purposes there. Yes. Such an iconic moment that it was one of the almost innumerable magpie borrowings in Francis Coppola's version of Dracula. Now, um, Van Helsing goes to comfort Tanya. Uh -huh. And he wraps his coat around her and he tells her that it makes her look a bit like a teddy bear. Anachronism. A, a teddy bear, as, mm. um, as Peter Cushing pronounces it. Now, um, I think that this was an ad lib on Peter Cushing's part, because it certainly doesn't appear in the shooting script. Right, yes. And as you just pointed out, it's an anachronism because the term teddy bear wasn't coined until well, was, the early 1900s. Of course, it was in relation to Theodore Roosevelt, the of course, American yeah. president. Uh, so, yes. so this is this is yet more evidence of Cushing not only rewriting Sangster's lines, but actually inventing lines of his own. Right. Well, it's a very tender moment. He's very kind to this child. And Yanina Fay does vividly remember that that astrakhan collar was very slippery and <laughs> however hard Cushing tried to wrap it round her it kept on slipping off which you can clearly see in the in the finished film here this is the scene look at that there's a gestural moment as soon as Van Helsing walks in completely unmotivated Goff suddenly turns round and puts his head in his hands I mean why was his head not already be in his hands well yes as you said earlier with these two actors on screen now we can see the tonal inconsistencies laid bare and we? we actually see in a moment Goff's line reading of how it's horrible and and at that moment it's almost as if Cushing is so exasperated that he literally grabs the guy by the wrist which is consistent with Van Helsing's irritation but you know I can't help thinking that Cushing was thinking for God's sake man you know <laughs> you're in the wrong movie <laughs> you know we're gonna see him grab his wrist in, in a minute um, I, 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 I mean, you know, I, I, I love Michael Goff, and you know, you, there was nobody better in subsequent films made for Herman Cohen and whoever, whether whether it was Black Zoo or Horrors mm. of the Black Museum or or much cheesier items from later like Satan's Slave or Horror Hospital. You know, you couldn't get anybody better for an absolute ravingly mad horror movie doctor. I mean, he was he was he was the man of choice for that stuff. Do you think he raised his game because of this film, or do you think he was just better suited to that type of material? I don't know. I mean, the only um, quotes I've seen of his about this film indicate that as far as he was concerned, it just it didn't have enough atmosphere. Exactly, yeah. He didn't rate it, did he? He didn't rate it. Explicably. He was unaware, like a lot of critics have been, that Hammer were creating a whole new, different version of gothic atmosphere. And after all, look at all those blue mists. I mean, that's pretty damn gothic and pretty damn atmospheric. We're about to see, we're about to see the moment I was referring to when Cushing grabs him by the wrist as if to wrestle him into the film that he's actually been cast in. Um. Well, after the title card, which we've discussed already, we're now coming up to the next of the restored scenes that we can see. Of course, yes. And this is common to both the 2007 and 2012 restorations of this film. In the British prints of this film, when Van Helsing staked Lucy, there were only two hammer blows, and we never saw the That's stake right. go in, and we never saw any blood. However, uh, this scene doesn't share the same mythical status as the other censor cuts because it was, in fact, left intact in the American yeah. version of the film and was present on the DVD that was released in 2002. Now, Terence Fisher once said, I am the great exponent of explicitness in horror. You've got to show the actual act of staking, which is not, of course, destruction in any shape or form. It happens to be a release. Liberation. Yes, which most of these people who say I deal in explicitness don't understand. 
As scripted, it is Arthur who summons the courage to stake his undead sister. Yes. He delivers three hammer blows, and then Van Helsing takes over to finish the job. Ah. Well, I think Fisher changed that deliberately because he. this was the emotional staking. This was the staking in the film that has some emotional weight because we've got to know Lucy, we like her. So to have... To have Van Helsing just watch on while Arthur stakes her would give you no real emotional pull. To, to make Arthur be the person who observes and does that balletic clutching of the wall and clutching of his chest at the moment of impact gives the scene emotional value. And here and we see the moment of release here on Lucy's this, of face. Course, Very important to Fisher. Yes. But the moment when Goth literally clutches the wall is one of those moments of gestural acting in this film, which I think really works. I mean, it's, it's really, it's quite painful and, and makes a powerful impact. Yes, yes. Okay, our Homewood is on side now. He's actually reading Jonathan's diary properly and he's actually quizzing Van Helsing about these strange creatures. Well, this is, the t- this is the moment when Van Helsing, this is the scene where Van Helsing tells Homewood that vampires transforming into bats or wolves is a common, common fallacy, fallacy which, is one of, it? which was taken by lots of purists at the time as one of Sangster's most impudent um, <laughs> lines of dialogue. <laughs> How dare he have Van Helsing say that? This, incidentally, is, in my estimation, the beginning of Act 3. The staking of Lucy brings the rather longer Act 2 to a close. You've got to have a relatively short Act 1 and we're going to have a relatively short Act 3. The longer middle section of the film is now over with the death of Lucy. And uh, now they are actually forming the kind of little syndicate of anti-vampire bourgeois characters who in the book comprise many more characters because Harker yes. is still alive. Yes. There's an American guy yeah. called Quincy Morris. Arthur Homewood is there, of course, although he's a he's an aristocrat in the book. Um, Lord Godalming. And uh, they all get behind Van Helsing as a kind of pack of hounds after the fox, which Dracula is explicitly referred to as in the book. Here, in classic Hammer and Jimmy Sangster style, there's an, an economy, there's a simplification. Now it's just Van Helsing and Homewood. And we can see why they used to call him Props Peter, can't we? He's managed to deliver all this dialogue, walking around the chair several times, uh, doing up his jacket, lighting a cheroot, Yes. all at the same time. Yes. Uh, We're about to see him actually doing another Cushing finger. And it's interesting, in later life, he was famous for only smoking with white gloves on and yes. because he was afraid of his finger going yellow. And I think you can see here that it was well, actually can, already beginning to. We can see the nicotine stains you on his finger You can see the nicotine there, stains yeah. on his finger. But the interesting thing is, just as per the book, this little group of vampire hunters don't really bring Mina on side. Uh, this is exactly what happens in the book, and it turns out to be disastrous because, of course, Mina turns out to be Dracula's next victim. Yes. Now, we're almost an hour into the film before we get any real light relief. And here it is in the shape of George Benson in his first Hammer appearance. This is the border crossing at Ingstadt. Yes. At this stage, this little bit of light relief is rather charming. Uh, Homewood becomes much less of a stuffed shirt and actually bribes the border guard. Yes. A very nice yes. comic touch. Um, now, uh, in 2009, I wrote a book called Hammer Glamour, and oh, we yes. held the launch at an art gallery in oh, London. Yes, I remember this. <laughs> now, um, while we were at the launch, I was, I was chatting to one of the guests for a while, and he said to me... There he is. I was in a Hammer film. I bet you can't <laughs> guess which one. I had absolutely no idea, and it seemed like quite a while before he told me um, who he was. It was Paul Cole, who plays the messenger boy in this yes. scene. Nice chap. He even remembers some of his lines from this film. Although he didn't say them, he sounds dubbed in this. Unless it was he dubbed with be. his own voice. He could be, yes. He could be. Hammer were notorious for that sort of thing. He's the messenger boy, and of course he subsequently turned up as one of the main pupils in Carry On Teacher, didn't he? <laughs> yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, see, in this scene, Michael Goff is kind of playing straight man, isn't he, to, yes. to George Benson? That's right. And this, is, this, this business with the uh, bills being put onto the spike as a means of blackmail is, is, is beautifully done. It is, yes. It beautifully is. done. And there are lovely little touches, like the border guard concealing the money and then walking around yeah. and uh, gesturing to his little pet bird with a little, <laughs> yeah. with a little clucking noise. Now, the, the interior of this uh, frontier post was, uh, was filmed on stage three at Bray, which was the same stage that Bernard Robinson had used for the interior of the inn. Now, the yes. dates in the screenplay get a little bit confusing here because Van yeah. Helsing asks for details of the journey he saw Dracula's hearse making on December the 1st. 
Yet Harker's diary dates his arrival to May the 3rd. Now, surely it can't have taken Van Helsing six months to follow Harker to Castle well, Dracula. Well, as I alluded to earlier, yes. Uh, basically, the whole thing takes place in late autumn, doesn't it? Yeah, and at October, least the date yeah. of December the 1st makes some sense of the autumnal weather. Yes. Now, Mina has foolishly gone to The Undertaker looking for Arthur, but, of course, it's a trap. It's a trap. Dracula has taken that messenger boy aside and pretended to be Arthur. Mm. This, again, is a classic moment of Hammer Horror with a huge contribution made by the white coffin that we saw earlier, which is a kind of Dracula signifier by now. Now we're back on stage two for this scene, which is the same stage that uh, Van Helsing's hotel room was constructed on. We can see it's quite a small space, certainly in comparison to stage one. And magically, the lid appears to move across and Dracula is caught just giving a fanged smile. We just catch it before the fade. Very subtle, very effective. I wonder if that made certain audience members scream in 1958. I wouldn't be at all, at all surprised. Now, Goff is coming into his own in this scene. Now that he's a fully-fledged Van Helsing assistant, he's actually, um, he's actually you know, doing some good stuff, I think. As is Homewood himself, I suppose. It's, it sort of chimes with Homewood's own development as a character. This yes. Now, Gerda reports that Mina is actually missing. And here she is. But she's not missing. She's well, come from the funeral parlour... Yes. ..where she's had a significant experience. Well, the smile on her face tells us that she's had quite a night at The Undertaker's. Terence Fisher told Melissa Stribling to imagine that she'd spent all night having the best sex of her life. That's right. And well, he had a photographic blow-up of her face in this scene, which she apparently treasured. <laughs> well, she's got that post-coital flush, and uh, it's, it's beautifully done. Um, he actually said... Um, he said, um, Mina suddenly appears after her encounter with Dracula, and I said to her, I'm going to go very close at this moment, and I want a reaction from you, please. She said, what reaction do you mean, Terry? So I said, for God's sake, you've had the most wonderful sexual night you've ever had in your world. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he went on to say, and she gave him that reaction. And he, Absolutely. It's uh, a very effective scene. Fantastic. It's a very effective scene. Uh, and a very, quite a, 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 a daring one for... For the period. Yes, I think I wasn't old enough to fully appreciate this film when I first saw it, and let's just leave it there, shall we? <laughs> now, here comes, uh, here comes Hammer's most notorious scene stealer, yes, Miles, Madison. Miles Madison. Christopher Lee was greatly enamoured of this scene, even though he doesn't appear in it. Uh, I remember, Jonathan, during one of the afternoons we spent with Christopher Lee, he reenacted the bit where Madison drums his hands, drums on, his the hands on the coffin. coffin. Well, Miles Madison was a playwright as well as an actor. He was also a big CND activist, and of course, CND were very active at this time with the Older Master marches starting. But Fisher did say that um, he called him a tremendously professional actor, a very kind man, and the drumming on the coffin, which is the most hilarious feature of this scene, <laughs> it came about purely by chance. While he was waiting in between takes, Miles would say something funny, and then he'd think of something else to follow that up, and he would go tapping on the coffins. And I said, keep it! This is tremendous! And as far as Fisher was concerned, it, it made the scene more macabre, in a way. It, and it's the kind of gallows humour that you know, that these films need to have dropped in. Yes. Judiciously, yes. from time to time, and Miles Mallison was yes. a past master. Now, Michael Goff's actually rather good in this scene, I think. He's got a beer stein in his hand, he's eating what might be a macaroon, I'm not sure, uh, and, yes, they're plotting out where all the graveyards in town might be, where Dracula might be hiding, and he is really good. Yes, as he's, he's being really quietly good. conspiratorial with Van Helsing. They're ignoring the woman, which I think is a very important feature. The men club together against this arch fiend who is himself male, and in doing so, they, they kind of leave the woman doing her needlepoint in a traditional female role. And, of course, this is a fatal mistake. Although, in this scene, they're going to find out that they've made a fatal mistake because they yes. realise that Mina is enthralled to Dracula yes. by the most physical means possible. Yes, well, Goff goes back to Stribling, and it's business as usual here, isn't it? Um, oh, with the line readings? Yes. yes. And, uh, uh, please wear this for my sake. Yes, uh, yeah, it, it's odd. It's a, it's a shame Fisher didn't have more time, I suppose. With, well, as with I said the before, actors. there just wasn't time for rehearsal, and that maybe would have ironed this sort of thing out. Yeah, yeah. But again, Melissa Stribling, uh, her reluctance to hold the thing, because she knows it will do that, literally burn her flesh, her polluted flesh. Yes. Um, and it now becomes clear that Dracula has, has violated Arthur's sister and his wife. And his wife. He's, he's, he's covering all bases. Uh, yes, and... Um, 
This Again, for 1958, this was a very graphic moment, and of course it parallels the even more graphic moment when that dirty great crucifix is attached to Lucy's forehead. But it indicates that even before they become undead, people can be, people bear the taint of the vampire and react accordingly when, yes, when yes. Uh, religious icons. Well, in the first act of the film, Harker refers to having a limited time, doesn't he, to actually um, carry out his task before he actually becomes right. completely formed. But yes, he's aware that he's, he's on the turn. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, Van Helsing is hatching a plan here to let Mina lead them to Dracula, and this is where Sanks to signpost the final act in his screenplay, which is going to be The Chase. Well, that's the final section of the final act, yes, and Homewood by now, of course, is aware that he has to go along with this plan because he regrets having not done the same with Lucy. Had he done so, Lucy might be alive. Yes, it's good to see that Arthur has now come to his senses and is now Van Helsing's willing accomplice. At this point, um, Arthur and Van Helsing are patrolling the outside of the house. And uh, contemporary audiences might have regarded that Peter Cushing looked rather like Tony Hancock. I think wearing that... <laughs> With his hot hat, 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 hat. Of course, he was one of the most popular television comedians of the day, wasn't he? <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. I like that. A very eye-catching use, again, of Fisher's favourite device of falling autumn leaves. Yes. Obviously being dropped down from the gantry by... Um, Cigarette chewing um, stagehands, <laughs> <laughs> but but creating a very very poetic oh yes effect oh yes and there's a nice the soundtrack has some nice wind effects here to indicate it's a chilly December night. Now Mina is eagerly anticipating a visit from her new lover. Uh, we're moving towards one of the most important scenes in the film, a scene that was central to Sangster and Fisher's reinterpretation of Dracula as a sexual story. Mm and a scene that Hammer foregrounded at every stage of their publicity for the film, from, from pre-release trade advertisements to, of course. to the famous quad poster. Yes. Unfortunately for Hammer, and indeed unfortunately for all of us, this very important scene fell victim to the British Board of Film Censors. Fisher said that Dracula had the power to hypnotise his female victims into believing that the bite was the culmination of a sexual experience. The version of Dracula's seduction of Mina that we see here is the curtailed version, grudgingly passed by the British Board of Film Censors for exhibition in British cinemas in 1958. It was the same in the American prints of the film. Terence Fisher's master shot of this scene now appears in the 2012 restoration. What we're looking at here appears to be a different angle on that master shot, or it could be a different take altogether. Yeah, yeah. Either way, the scene is abruptly curtailed and we cut to the shot of the owl. Even this was the result of a compromise. On February 14th, 1958, John Nichols, the secretary of the BBFC, instructed Hammer to cut to the owl immediately after Mina gets on the bed. We have the tenacious Tony Hines to thank for the fact that we see as much as we do here. Well, of course, Tony Hines was one of the key architects of Hammer Horror and he was very keen on emphasising Dracula's sexual element, so no wonder he defended it so heartily. It's a really transgressive scene. And of course, there's a moment when Dracula slams the door and he slams the door on the camera. The British Board of Film Censors would have liked the scene to be cut at that point. That's exactly what they yes, wanted. Yes, and Hines said he would, but didn't. Yes. But the interesting thing about that little moment is that, of course, Terence Fisher and so many of the Hammer personnel, in particular Jack Asher, the cinematographer, were veterans of Gainsborough pictures from the 40s. And... Terence Fisher isn't credited on this film, but there was a Gainsborough picture from 1945 called Madonna of the Seven Moons, which I'm sure Fisher must have remembered, because there's a very dynamic scene there where Stuart Granger rushes to meet Phyllis Calvert in her room, and they have a big embrace and a kiss, and then Stuart Granger gets hold of the door and slams it on the camera to indicate that rude things are going to happen. And, of course, the scene doesn't go beyond that point. Uh, Fisher reproduces it here with the slamming of the door, but he does go beyond that point, and we see what happens on the bed. But I think that's a direct quote from Madonna of the Seven Moons. For any Gainsborough aficionados out there, I'll, um, I'll just throw that in. Dracula was published in 1897. Um, yes, when blood transfusions weren't really possible. Well, no, it was four years before the discovery of different blood types, so the exactly. procedure we see here is presumably quite risky for Mina. Mind you, that's, <laughs> that's the least of her problems, I think, <laughs> at, at this point. Well, really, the use of blood transfusions, in a way, was, uh, again, one of Stoker's really modern technological things that he mm. brought to bear to this story of an ancient evil. He brought so much modern stuff to it, uh, including typewriters and phonographs and God knows what, that... Um, 
it almost reads like science fiction here and there, particularly with blood transfusions. By this stage, Hammer were already the kings of exploitation and promotional gimmickry in the UK. But this scene brings to mind one of their less successful publicity stunts. Uh, the Blood Transfusion Service <laughs> noticed this scene and decided to mount an exhibition in the foyer of the Gaumont Cinema in Birmingham. Uh, the exhibit featured a dummy patient having an emergency transfusion. They apparently recruited 41 new donors, but the exhibition was very quickly withdrawn uh, on the grounds that it was in poor taste. Well, I think maybe it was, although there was a long history of that. I believe that the Red Cross had been involved in the stage presentations of Dracula in the 20s. Really? I didn't yes, know that. Yes, they used to have Red Cross nurses standing by. Whether they were really Red Cross nurses, who can say? But, yeah, it was a very similar publicity stamp. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there's a kind of lot of continuity between the, the many British manifestations of Dracula, at any rate. Well, Birmingham's town councillors were obviously a lot more, in, uh, a lot more sensitive to that sort of thing uh, in summer 1958. One thing we haven't mentioned at all yet, and we're not going to be able to touch on it in any detail because the thrilling chase sequence that ends the film is just around the corner. One thing we haven't touched upon is the, is the reviews for this film, which constituted an outcry of disgust in many, in many quarters. Um, again, I think critics, British critics in particular, were horrified by the fact that this disgusting film was uh, this un-English topic had come from an English studio. And with the addition of Hammer's other ingredient, which had not been so visible in The Curse of Frankenstein, i.e. sex, they were all the more appalled. Nina Hibbin uh, came, gave a particularly famous outcry of horror saying that she left the film, she went to see the film prepared to have a nervous giggle, I left it revolted and outraged. C.A. Lejeune, of course, famously said that she apologised to all decent Americans for sending them a work in such sickening bad taste. This was just the... This is just skimming the surface of a lot of, lot of nasty responses. Yes, I mean, it's just astonishing, isn't it, to consider that people are that outraged by a film that now has a 12 certificate. Now has a 12 certificate. Now, one thing I have the BFI's restoration of this film is the way it's preserved the super vivid colours we would expect from a hammer horror of this period. I mean, Terence Fisher once said, I choose a precise but not too realistic use of colour. And I think we can see those precise splashes of slightly exaggerated colour yep. right here in this composition. Yep. Oh, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous to behold. We're going to have a classic Cushing moment here which triggers off the chase sequence when Gerda says, oh, I don't like to ask for more wine because Madam told me... There you go. <laughs> Not to go into the cellar. Yes. And of course, Van Helsing thinks, yes, of course. That's, and that totemic white coffin is now in the... It's like a kind of home invasion scenario, yes. as it would be called now. For, yes. for some totally illogical reason, Dracula walks in at that point and <laughs> snarls. Snarls, yes. But yes, and the final chase begins. The, the monstrous aristocrat has insinuated himself into the very heart Yes, he's, he's violated their household he's as well. Literally as, viol yes. He's got his coffin installed in the cellar. He's and we can see there why um, Peter Cushing felt that Van Helsing became something of a crucifix salesman. In this <laughs> he's film. he's he does, just he's, bristling with He does seem to produce them at every juncture, doesn't he? And here's a lovely bit of Cushing athleticism. Over he goes. And I must say, Olga Dickey gives a lovely performance in this scene. She does, The yes. moment when Van Helsing slaps her always gets a laugh. Oh, yeah. why shouldn't it? But her hysterics, he looked like the devil and he carried... Mm. He Madden picked Madame like up like she was a baby. Like she was a baby. Which is I, surely a reference to Dracula's supernatural strength. I mean, we, we could we recall his eagerness to carry Harker's suitcase up the stairs at the beginning of the film. That's right. Which oh, he I'll seems to do in an effortless way, doesn't he? Yes. As he glides up the stairs. Absolutely. Uh, and now the, the chase is on. What can we say about this dead coachman? Well... Van Helsing and Homewood are heading for Castle Dracula and they find a dead body in the road. Now, it's originally scripted. There was a scene here where Dracula procured a coach by planting the unconscious Mina in the middle of the road. A coach driver approaches her and Dracula attacks him, stealing his coach. Now, when Van Helsing finds the body, he runs his fingers along the wound in the driver's neck and concludes that he's had his throat cut. Oof. This was censored by the BBFC at script stage, but a reworking of this lost scene would find its way into The Brides of Dracula. Uh, of course. The film's yes. sequel. Yes, absolutely. OK, the, the chase is on. I mean, we really are gearing up for what I think stands as still one of the most exciting 
endings in, in any horror film. I mean, for my yes. money, I'd say it is the most exciting. But perhaps, unfortunately, it's interrupted... It's interrupted ..by some here. more comedy and business with the asthmatic border guard. And I wonder if this yes. is perhaps a gag too far, especially at this, the most urgent stage the of the film. most urgent stage, you drop in a bit of comedy relief. Although I might point out that in that scene you do see the border guard's calendar on the wall, which says 18th of December. So ah. for anybody who's really nerdy about these things... Christopher Lee's Dracula's first on-screen death took place on the 18th of December, 1885. It's good to know. It's good to know. Uh, it also distracts one slightly from George Benson's <laughs> comic <laughs> mugging here, which, which in any other circumstances would be delightful, but yes. as you say, it's a bit late in the day for this Rather, kind of Rather odd to have placed it here. Yes, and I oh, think. good Lord, yes, there's mugging galore there. Um, yes, I think that was a mistake. I think we can officially call that a mistake. Well, from this point on, Terence Fisher and his editor, Bill Lenny, don't take their feet off the throttle. Here we see that Dracula has taken Mina to his castle, he's dug a grave, and he's casually dropping her into it. I think this is a most peculiar scene in which Dracula resembles a dog burying a bone for future consumption. Uh, of course, initially he was just throwing Melissa Stribling's stunt double in, but Melissa Stribling did remember... When it came to my turn, I was lying in the bottom of the grave and Chris Lee was nothing if not keen. He jumped in and made a funny remark to the director about, you can leave us alone for a while, I'm not going to waste this opportunity. <laughs> uh, I'm, I don't know whether Chris really was that saucy, but it's a, it's a sweet story. And now here is that, um, there's the moment I mentioned, Dracula bounds up those stairs like some supernatural being. Van Helsing clatters up in his wake. The sheer velocity and intensity of this sequence is quite unlike anything else in the Hammer canon. I Except think. possibly the ending of Frankenstein must be destroyed, which I think is almost as exciting. It's sort of getting there. There's a slight continuity illogicality here. Dracula seems to have taken an awfully long time lifting up that flagged hatch in the floor while Van Helsing pauses outside. And the visceral nature of this... I mean, this is the classic Hammer clash between good and evil made physical... Well, here we see that, that supernatural strength that we mentioned earlier, don't we? Because yes. Van Helsing finds it almost impossible to resist him. That's right. And, you know, you've got Cushing and Lee here at the top of their game. They're at the, they're at the beginning of their horror careers, and it's just a wonder to behold the, the uh, chemistry between the two, even in this really heavy physical confrontation. Yeah. James Bernard's score, which we've not talked much about, makes an amazing contribution here. You've got these... Shots of Lee stalking Van Helsing with the red glow in his eyes, looking like some beast, and Bernard's trumpets are flaring on the soundtrack in a deeply disconcerting way. Van Helsing retreats further into the library, where stacks of books are tied together, and then he vaults over the table, tears down the curtains, and lets in the sunlight. The disintegration sequence we see here is the abridged version, rather reluctantly passed by the British Board of Film Censors for exhibition in British cinemas in 1958. It's the same version of the disintegration that played in American cinemas. As well as having different sound effects, it loses a number of key shots, including Dracula's disintegrating leg, a reaction shot from Van Helsing, and most notably Dracula clawing the decaying flesh from his own face. Lovely. These cuts were the subject of fierce debate and negotiation between John Nichols, the secretary of the BBFC, and James Carreras and Tony Hines of Hammer between February and April 1958. On February the 14th, Nichols wrote, The flash of disintegrating ankle is all right. Under no circumstance can the shot of his disintegrating face be seen. Very little, if any, of this disintegration can be permitted. What we see here is the resulting compromise. Even in this abridged form, I think this is still a very impressive sequence. Fantastic, oh yes. Considerable credit is due to Sidney Pearson for the special effects, Phil Leakey for the makeup, and Bill Lenny and James Needs for the editing. There's something very forlorn and mournful and poetic about this ending. You have the fairy tale disappearance of the cruciform burn from Mina's hand. We then cut back into the library with the morning wind blowing Dracula's remains across the stone flagged floor, Van Helsing putting on his gloves, a little final bat like flapping of the cloak, and all that's left is Dracula's signet ring with a little bit of dust underneath it and the zodiac effect of the floor underneath. It's a beautiful ending. And Despite the fact that Lee is possibly the most evil and remorseless vampire in film history, you do actually feel sorry for him at this point. As Which I think, was, of course, was, was Lee's aim, wasn't it? To, to yes. sort of foreground the tragedy of he the character. He talks a lot about the loneliness of evil, yeah. and he actually foregrounded it more in subsequent attempts at the role. But uh, I think it comes across here because there's something rather tragic about this ending. You're glad to see mm. him go, but you can't help but be 
a little moved. Well, it's I surely think. one of the most memorable conclusions to any horror film, I think, and the yes. sequence that sealed this film's considerable reputation. Horror cinema and indeed Bram Stoker's Dracula would never be the same. And the 2007 restoration of Dracula closes with the original distributor credit for Universal International. For this restoration, we must thank the British Film Institute National Archive, Warner Brothers, YCM Laboratories and Midnight Transfer. And finally, my thanks to you, Jonathan, for joining me on this commentary. <laughs>